Hello, this is Elisa Rodriguez, and this is Arianism Today. So today we are going to be looking at the theology of Arius, specifically a writing that he made called the Thylea. Generally, it is said inaccurately that we don't know what Arius said or wrote because all of his writings were burned. Well, it's true, as far as I know, that all of his writings were burned, but it doesn't mean that his words were not preserved. In other words, his writings, the original ones are probably burned and probably don't exist, but Athanasius and others did preserve what he said to teach other bishops and other church leaders what he said and trying to give them a foundation on how to refute Arius and Arians in general. So, <clears throat> um, obviously we know that the, con the controversy with Arius and Alexander led to the Council of Nicaea and um, then kind of like a church crisis for nearly a hundred years or a little less than a hundred years. And so what we want to do is just look at his theology and kind of get a, get a grip, get a grasp of what he believes. And so it's important for you to get, you know, understand the theology of Arius from someone who is believing Arianism as well as is a believer in Arianism. Not that we follow Arius or anything like that, but someone who feels like they understand and believe that concept in theology. Just to let you know, I did not start out... Um, advocating for Arius or anything like that. I believe the scriptures, I read the scriptures, and then I went and studied early church theology to find out if my, kind of my conclusions of the scripture were kind of validated with the early church. I found that, and then I came to across who Arius was and gave me a greater understanding of how strong and how consistent my belief system what I see in the early church, what I saw in the New Testament, and what I saw from Arius and his people who agreed with him, that this was the original belief system. And so, <clears throat> whether you agree or not, it's good that you get a perspective of someone who does agree with Arius so that we can move into greater and greater understanding. So, the Thylea is generally accepted that it is the best example or demonstration of what he believed. There are arguments on whether they can be believed because Athanasius, who was a very underhanded person, preserved it and whether he's to be trusted or not. <clears throat> and I think that R.P.C. Hansen, who is a scholar of Arianism, um, believes that it is, it is um, a good representation and other scholars who have uh, examined it say that there might have been a slight tampering here and there, but nothing of you know of nothing of substance. Maybe different words were used, um, but the still the same idea was conveyed. So I think it's safe to use the Thylea. I think it's absolutely consistent with what um, Arius believed. I believe, and what I believe, um, be, because it's consistent with what I've seen in the. In the scriptures. So um, <clears throat> let's look at what he says and see if that has any biblical support. So <clears throat> the Thylea says it begins with, and so God himself, as he really is, is inexpressible to all. Um, he, in other words, he can't be seen by anyone. He, um, you can obviously be influenced by him, but he, is very awesome. It's hard to express or, or understand or comprehend God. He alone has no equal, no one similar, and no one of the same glory. And so what it's talking about there is that God's glory is different than anyone else's glory. No one is equal and no one is similar to him. Equal in authority um, and similar to him in in different in certain aspects like being eternal 
So there are differences there between him and anything else that has ever existed. So that's the idea. I don't think anyone, Trinitarian or otherwise, would disagree with this, except for in itself, in and of itself, except we know that Trinitarians understand that he's not talking about the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He's only talking about the Father. And so we move on. And we want to look at some scriptures because he talked about no one is equal with God. So, <clears throat> and you look at the way um, Arius is writing, he's saying no one is equal with God. And so his concept of who God is, is the Father. And so he's saying no one is equal with God. And so when we look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, in Arius' eyes, when he reads this, it says, Who, although he existed in the form or morphe of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. So it says that he existed, talking about Jesus, existed in the outward appearance of God. In other words, he was he had the the what would you would say like the form or the kind that God is. And part of that is because he is the image of God. But it's saying he existed in the form of God. In other words, he had the, the form of God. Similarity. So when you, when you think about that, I want you to think about a human who's having a child or had a child. Uh, a human having a child, that child is going to be, be like him in, um, in kind. So he's going to be a human as well. A human has human children. So therefore, human has a human, you call that child a human. And so when God has a child, when God decides to make a child uh, from himself, not from himself necessarily, but God is willing to make a child, <clears throat> what would you call that child if God was making him after himself in every sense of the word? You would call them a God or God-like, something like that. And so what it's talking about here is, although he existed in the form of God, and it's relaying how much of a son he was. It's not an adoption of the son. It's not a um, anything not real. It's that he was making him after himself. And so therefore he is like his, I mean, like literal child. So even though... All other things are made through Christ. God himself made Jesus by himself. And so because God made Jesus by himself and then through Jesus made all other things, that's why God can say that he alone created all things, that he spread out the heavens and everything else alone because he is the only one who created all things. That's including Jesus. So even Jesus, if Jesus is a helper, along with him in any of those things, it doesn't count for Jesus because, uh, as being the creator of all things, because even Jesus is part of the creation. He wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the will of God wanting to make him. And so therefore, he's actually a son of God. So he's after God's kind, if you want to say. So you have plants that make after their own kind, animals that make after their own kind, humans make after their own kind, and God, at this point, made Jesus after his own kind, so he's in the form of God. Then it says, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. So the equality that it's talking about for Arius and for Arians is that Jesus was equal with the Father in talking about in the, in who they were, as far as like, um, I'm a human and another human. We're equal humans. Um, so that's, in that sense, you would say that Jesus is equal with the Father in kind. The difference is, is that the Father has always existed and the Son has not always existed. He came into existence at the will of the Father. And so when you have a child, you are not giving that child your age, your knowledge, your, you know, your understanding, None of those things go with that child being born from you. They're not 
inheriting your strength, your positions, your all, all of that stuff is not granted in birth because you're birthed from someone. So you, you're not as smart as the person who you're born from. You have to learn on your own. You have your own, you know, path that you have to live out. You don't, you know, inherit all of that knowledge. You don't inherit, which would be great if that was possible, but you don't inherit all of that knowledge. You don't inherit the age. You don't inherit all of those experiences and that you can learn from those experiences because they're kind of like downloaded into your brain. It's not that way with children. And so, you know, when you when you make a child, then that child doesn't have all of those things. So when Jesus is made from the Father, he doesn't have all power. He doesn't have all the knowledge like the Father does. He doesn't have all the experiences that his Father uh, has. He doesn't inherit all that. All he's inheriting from his Father is the DNA, let's say, from his Father. So the DNA... Um, if you want to call it that, spiritually, DNA is given to the son, but it's just like any other child. He's not granted all of those things. He has to learn on his own, which there's a lot of scriptures that talk about Jesus having to learn and grow and understand and, and, and things like that, being given authority and all of that. So it shows that he is only equal in because he was made after the father's image, after the father spiritually but not that he is that god for example it's not saying that god birthed some new individual into his soul that is part of his person or identity that's not the way this is it's talking about you can't mix an always existent being with a not always existent being and when you think about child or son Every time it says son for Jesus, it's talking about him not always existing and then coming from the father. These concepts are kind of weird because if you have a father and a son, but the son has always existed, then really, in reality, the father and the son are not father and son, but friends. They're not technic they would not technically be father and son because they're not technically related to each other. If the son hasn't has always existed, he has no father. If you have two eternally existent beings, you can't say that one ha is the father or the son of the other because that's not possible. You can't be the, the son of just being being called the son of someone else shows that the other one existed prior to the other. There should be no problem if there was a trinity where all three are co-eternal. There should be no theological problem with saying that each one of them are God without calling one the Son. And because technically that would be confusing the concept of the trinity and going against what Son means and going against what Father means. And so therefore, you, when you institute the word Son, it's making it sound like there's something different about this. And so when you see this, it, and another part of this that needs to be looked at <clears throat> is that it says that he existed in the form of God. So if he was God, you wouldn't say that he, is a, he existed in the form of God. So you look at you, right? If I'm talking about you, I'm not going to say um, whatever your name is. Um, so... I'll say Bob for now, right? For Bob, but you insert your own name. Bob, who existed in the form of Bob, right, did not e regard equality with Bob a thing to be grasped. Now you put your name in there, right? My name's Eliseo, so although Eliseo existed in the form of Eliseo, he did not regard equality with Eliseo a thing to be grasped. If you look at that, doesn't make sense. Now, you could say, well, you're supposed to say Father and God and here, you know, here and there. Not technically, because God in the Trinitarian concept is all three. So Jesus existed in the form of Trinity, technically, because God is not just the Father in the Trinity. The Holy Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit in and of himself is not the whole of God. 
in the concept of the Trinity, all three together is the complete God. And so therefore, although, you know, Jesus existed in the form of the Trinity, he did not regard equality with the Trinity a thing to be grasped. So if you're the, if you're f existing in the form of the Trinity, then it was, kind of sounds like, or God here, but it kind of sounds like he's not part of the Trinity, but like made to look like the Trinity, right? Although he formed, although Jesus existed in the form of the Trinity, if that's the way you want to take it, if you want to take it as though it's talking about the Father, which is generally really what it's saying in Arian eyes, then it's saying, or God, the Father who is God in Arian eyes. So when it says, although he exists in the form of God, means he's not God, but he was made after his form. So he's very similar to God, but he's not equal with God in that fullest extent, but he's the Son of God. It's just kind of relaying how much of a son he is. So he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Okay. <clears throat> so that's one explanation about how Jesus is equal. Talking about his kind, he's equal with God in kind, but not that he's the same authority, that he's the same rank, that he's the same being, being God, being part of that, because that's, that's not the way it goes. Um, so we have to think about it, how these people who are reading it for the first time are going to understand it. And their concept is not of, 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 you know, of God making another personality of himself inside of himself. Um, that's so complicated and it would have to be put in the text there. So it's only talking about if we're going to just read and see what this text says is that Jesus existed in the form of the Almighty, right? In the form of the Almighty, he did not recall, regard equality with the Almighty that he got from the from God, a thing to be kept or a thing to be, you know, um, a thing to be seized. Like he didn't want to let go of it. So <clears throat> his similarity to God is something that he emptied himself of, so that he could become a human and save us. So that's the context. But so when we look back. At this, it says, and so God himself, as he really is, is inexpressible to all. He alone, he alone has no equal, no one similar, and no one of the same glory. So the, talking about the glory of the Almighty is different from the glory of the Son because the Son is made by the will of the Almighty. So you're, you're, there's a difference there. So in, in one sense, obviously, we understand that that Jesus was equal in kind, but he was not equal all the way. And so what Arius is saying is that he has no equal fully and that no, no one of the same glory. So although Jesus has some glory he experienced uh, and he has glory from being his, the son of God and being um, who he is, there's differences between that and differences between that and being equal with God saying, you know, they're identical and they're one in the same. It's very different. And so that's what Aries is trying to convey at the very beginning is that there is a God who is way more important, way more inexpressible, no equal, fully no equal, no one in, you know, in that same similar who's sharing his person um, and that he is of unequaled glory talking about the Father only. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so the next verse that we need to look at. So it says, For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but he was also calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. And so this is a, another affirmation or confirmation of the way in which Philippians chapter 2 verse 6 needs to be looked at. Here it says that he was breaking the Sabbath and the Jews were very unhappy about that, but also he was saying that God was his own father. And they understood that he was saying that God was his literal father, that he was born from the father, uh, literally. And so they were saying, look, if you're saying that you're an actual child of God, that God alone made you and that you only exist because the father made you, on his own. If that's what you're trying to say, you're trying to say that you were once equal with God in kind. And no one is equal with God in kind. Talking about, you know, no one has made 
you know, after the God, after God's kind. And so they understood that he was trying to say, look, I'm a son and I'm a son in the most literal sense. Now he's, he's saying that he was making him, they were saying that he was making himself equal with God, not to, not, not that he was making himself God almighty, right? And they were understanding that Jesus was saying, Hey, I am the offspring of God, literally. Okay. Just whatever it takes for you to understand that I'm the offspring of God. That's what I want you to understand. So they understood that he was saying that he was a child of God, but you notice that Jesus was not telling them that he was a Trinity. He, if he was saying that he was uh, a Trinity, then it would say that he was making himself the God or something like that. It would be saying that he making himself the God, but it's saying equal with God. So it's saying not that he's one with God and that he is the very same one almighty God, but that he's saying that I'm the child of God. He's my father in the most literal sense, and therefore I am the son of God. And you just let those dominoes in your mind just keep flowing through, and you can fully understand that that means that I was at one point in the same kind that God is. God made me after his own kind. And so that was the part where they were like, okay, you're really saying something absolutely in their opinion, you know, it was lunacy. But notice that the Bible is not saying, because this is a, a, they're injecting this so that, so that you can understand what the Jews were thinking. And so it says, for this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling his own, God his own father, making himself equal with God. John is writing that so that you would understand, look, the Jews were understanding that he was really saying he was the son of God, which is the entire point of what the book of John is for. And so, um, so being called equal with God doesn't mean that he's saying he is God. He's saying he's very similar to his father. Um, not that he has all the power, all the authority, all the knowledge, all of that stuff that his father has, um, who is God, but that he is after after his father's kind. So that was very blasphemous to the Jews. They've never even thought of someone saying such things. And so therefore there was a there was an issue. So in that sense you see that he's not calling uh so in that sense he's equal with God in that kind, but what Arius is saying is that he's not equal fully in all aspects. So if you're not exactly equal, talking about all authority, all power all of those things, it's different. So, so the Jews understood the difference that what he was saying. And so Arius is saying if he's not equal in everything. He's not all exist, existing since eternity past. Um, you know, that Jesus is different. Jesus came into existence. The Father has never come into existence. And so they're, they're equal in kind, but not equal all the way. And so he's talking about the most absolute extreme sense of equal. So John 13, 16 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is the uh, one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. So Jesus is saying out of his own mouth that he that he's not greater than the one who sent him. And so therefore, there is no equality there out of the, out of the mouth of Jesus. He is saying the same thing that Arius is saying. Arius is saying that there is no, e you're not fully equal with Jesus is not fully equal, and no one is fully equal with God Almighty. And Jesus is saying, um, <clears throat> a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. So who sent Jesus? He says repeatedly that the Father sent him. The Bible says that the Father sent Jesus repeatedly. And so that means that they're not equal. There is The Father is greater than the Son. And so... You can say equal in a certain sense, right? Equal in, in kind, but not in, in the fullest and most extreme sense. Is Jesus and the Father equal? And so, although it sounds misplaced or mis, you know, like it's contradicting the Bible, even Jesus himself said, we're not equal. And so therefore, when we go back to what Arius says about God, he says, and so God himself, as he really is, is inexpressible to all. He alone has no equal, no one similar, and no one of the same glory. You can understand that he's talking about in the most absolute sense.
And so I'm going to leave it right there. But when we go further into the next pieces of his writing, we're going to keep digging it up and looking at it in more depth to try to get an answer on what is he talking about? Who um, and what's the context and 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 delve deep into what Arius believes. So I appreciate you guys. You have a great week. Um, we'll try to post another video as quickly as possible. Thank you. Have a good day.